Hey, this is Presh Hullwalker. Negative 1 cubed is equal to negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, which is of course equal to negative 1. So one day, you're playing around with Wolfram Alpha, and you wonder, what's the cube root of negative 1? You type that in, and you get the result of negative 1. No problem here. But then you wonder, what would happen if I type in negative 1 raised to the fractional exponent 1 over 3? So you think you would get the answer of negative 1, but instead you get something totally different. You get the complex number 1 half plus i root 3 over 2. There's also some notation that Wolfram Alpha is assuming the principal root. So what exactly is going on? We have negative 1 raised to the fractional exponent 1 over 3 is a complex number, and the cube root of negative 1 is equal to negative 1. And amazingly, these two things are not the same output. In order to understand this, we'll take a step back. Consider the equation x squared is equal to 4. There are two solutions to this equation. x is equal to 2 is the solution because 2 squared is equal to 4. x is equal to negative 2 is also a solution because negative 2 squared is also equal to 4. We can think about this graphically. Consider y is equal to x squared. This graph will be a parabola. And for every y value greater than 0, there are two x values. Now let's say we wanted to invert this function to the square root function. y is equal to square root of x. You can invert functions by reflecting them about the line y is equal to x. So we would end up with this parabola. Now we have a problem with this parabola. This is not going to be a function. By the vertical line test, we can see that every single x value greater than 0 is being assigned to two y values. A function has to assign every single x value to one y value. So how can we fix this? Consider a tree with many different branches. You could prune off some of the branches so you're left with just one branch. So we're going to do the same thing here. This parabola has two branches, one going up and one going down. So if we prune this bottom branch, we're left with just one branch at the top. And now, square root of x is a function. And this is known as the principal square root. So this always comes up in online discussions. If you have something like the square root of 9, is it equal to negative 3 and plus 3, or just plus 3? Typically, we want to just take the non-negative value. So square root of 9 is equal to 3, which is one value. So to summarize, if x is a positive number and n is a positive integer, we have y is equal to x to the power of n. This will have n solutions. If we take the nth root of x, this will exactly be equal to x to the power of 1 over n. And this will be the principal root. And again, we take a single value so that we can make a function so we can do everything we could normally do with functions. Now, what if instead we consider x is less than 0? y is equal to x to the power of n. We'll still have n solutions. But what can we say about the nth root of x and x to the power of 1 over n? In order to understand that, we have to get complex. So we have the complex plane here. And consider a number z is equal to a plus bi. We can write this in polar form as r multiplied by e to the i theta. So imagine we have a circle here. We have the point z. So the radius of this circle will be r. And then this angle theta will be theta. Now, of course, you could add any multiple of 2 pi. You'll still get the same angle. So we could also write this as r multiplied by e to the power of i multiplied by the angle theta plus 2 pi k, where k is an integer. So now, we want to take z to the power of 1 over n. This will be the set of n roots. Now we can do this to the polar form, and we get the result, the nth root of r, multiplied by e to the power of i, multiplied by the angle theta over n plus 2 pi k over n. This will have distinct roots for k equaling 0, 1, 2, all the way to n minus 1. The n roots also have a nice graphical interpretation. They will be the endpoints of a regular n-gon.
Now, if you set k is equal to zero, you get the principal value of the nth root of z. So let's see how this works out with z is equal to negative one. So first we have z is equal to negative one. We want to write this in polar form. So we first see that z is equal to negative one is this point right here. The radius will be equal to one and the angle will be theta is equal to pi. So in polar form, this is equal to e to the power of i pi plus two pi k. We now want z to the power of one over three. So this will be the set of three roots. This works out to be the cube root of one multiplied by e to the power of i multiplied by the angle pi over three plus two pi k over three. We get distinct roots for k is equal to zero, one, and two. So if we set k is equal to zero, we get the principal root, which is e to the power of i pi over three, which equals one half plus i root three over two. And this is exactly what Wolfram Alpha was outputting as the principal value of negative one to the power of one over three. If we plot the three roots, we get that they are the endpoints of this equilateral triangle. We have the principal value here, then we have the real root of negative one comma zero, and then the other root is the conjugate of this principal root. So now let's summarize. If we have a negative number, then y is equal to x to the power of n. How does that compare to the nth root of x and x to the power of one over n? So y is equal to x to the power of n. Of course, we'll have n solutions here. Now the nth root of x somewhat will depend on context. There are reasons to use the real root value. So let's say for some reason, you had a negative velocity and you need to take the cube root of that. You're working on a physics problem. Well, it might make sense to take the real root because you want this real value for your solution. But this could also refer to the principal root, which may sometimes be a complex number. Now, x to the power of one over n can be used to denote the set of n roots, but it might also be used to denote the principal root. This will depend a little bit on context. But the general point is that the nth root of x and x to the power of one over n may not be the same thing in all contexts. And it's an important distinction to know. The definitions and conventions presented in this video are what I found in my textbooks and in my research online. But I will warn that there is no standard definition of a principal value that's accepted across all texts. But just because one text says one thing and another text says another thing, doesn't mean you have to call the whole thing off. Just pay extra attention to the convention that's being used, and then you can readily solve the problem and be on your way. Thanks for making us one of the best communities on YouTube. See you next episode of Mind Your Decisions, where we solve the world's problems one video at a time.